Yeah, that was a really unusual series in that um, every program was made by one person. So we researched it, filmed it, and edited it and wrote the script a lot. And they were half hour stories. One of the things that I think that made it successful was that we all weren't young. We, we were all in our 20s, or in my case, early 30s. So some of us, we had experience of life, which was really useful in making documentary, actually. It's hard to know what's significant if you haven't had a bit of life experience to put things in context. And people have thought about replicating that series again. And it's a great idea. It was a, it's a great way to learn a craft. Um, but we all weren't straight out of school or film school. It was an amazing experience because it was so hostile. I mean, I didn't do one single interview in the weeks I was there that wasn't interrupted by gunfire. And there's people, it looked like something like Berlin after the war. I mean, it was just what, what was once a beautiful, had been a lovely kind of Italian style kind of city, um, was just, you know, had been bombed and, and and artillery shells had just broken it up and there was all the buildings had holes in them and there was dead tanks everywhere. And there was still, and everybody, nobody drove a car without an armed person with them. Um, everyone was armed and there wasn't a single interview I did in, in all the time I was there that wasn't interrupted by gunfire at some stage. As a kind of young man, I was really interested in what that was like. Um, so it was that kind of being, alternating between a certain amount of exhilaration at being alive and being scared also um, a lot of the time, you know, and that was, and it was all just a really eye-opening experience. I'd never been to a place that was, had, that was anything like that. Now, I located all the guys that, that had survived the Rose Noel and I finally tracked down John Glenny, the captain, and I arranged to go and interview him over in um, Seattle. Um, John is a really interesting character, a really interesting man. And I really enjoyed John's company, though uh, it was a bit of a nightmare trying to film the interview. It was just trying to find a place to film the interview was really difficult, but it was a, that was kind of an extraordinary. Again, his story was extraordinary, and at the end of the interview with John, the soundy sort of took off his headphones and went, that is one of the most amazing stories I have ever heard, you know. Um, Al used to give the, the crew a hard time too, because they, they, I was in the car and I used to rifle through the, the glove box, and they were going, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? I said, your handgun, where's your handgun? And, you know, and kind of those irony-free Americans are going, well, Mark, what, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, what, can we go on a drive-by? And they're going, Mark, not everybody in America has a handgun, and I'm going, you know, sort of like just didn't get that I was just joking, but. In the first series, they actually went and found interesting graves and, and then tried to research the story behind them. And of course, not every interesting grave has an interesting story. And at some point in the first series, they realised that they are actually, all we're looking for is great stories from history. So what they did then for the second series is they went and found old history books and found really great unknown stories because there's always a grave. And then you just, you find a fantastic story of a bank robbery gone wrong or something and then just find a grave that one, someone connected to it is. Um, and then we went into it that way. They were quite well crewed. We had DOPs and first ADs and you know, it was a really um, full on sort of drama set up but without imposing dialogue on the actors. And I think it's a great, look, it's a fantastic idea. I'm really surprised that Greenstone haven't sold it as a format. You know, you could sell it as the Sexton's Tales or, you know. Um, and so it was very exciting as a director to, to be able to do that. And also because you had stories from history um, and good stories, they already had in their way in, inbuilt great narratives anyway. And so look, I did Mini Dean, which was, Fantastic. Um, I did, uh, what's her name that impersonated a man until her wedding day? That The con artist, they've tried to make a fantastic story of a woman and, and lots of others as well. There were cameras everywhere in this house. And what happened was the flatmates became really disillusioned with what was going on to the point where in the grand finale, you know, 
someone ripped their camera, they, sorry, ripped their contract up on in front of the camera and went out and peed on it, you know. And a well-known local person fell for one of the flatmates and had drugs delivered to them, you know, in a, in a house with his cameras on every room 24 hours a day, you know, it's just kind of like crazy. But it was insanely successful. It, it, the audience share was something like 40-something percent. It was unheard of, you know. Um, it, yeah, it was a, and it was mad, just mad, you know. <laughs> but it was, again, great fun. But uh, there were times when I was in there having conversations with people which were being streamed to the internet, and I'm just thinking, I'm so glad my mum isn't on the internet listening to this. Nigel and I just started talking, and we realised we had very similar backgrounds. We sort of did the same degrees, you know, the BSc in zoology and then in psychology and stuff. And we got on really well, and so we just talked about doing other things. And then I realised that he started that he he also wrote books on parenting. So we just decided to make a show about parenting. And then I saw him do his talk and thought that he was, you know, for parents, thought he was really funny and a good performer. So we we decided to make. Uh, a parenting show that didn't look like other parenting shows and, and, and incorporate a sort of stand-up routine at the start. It seems normal now, but at the time it was very unusual. The Australians call it very progressive and still have difficulty. And almost every territory you take that show to, it's like, but this doesn't look like kind of shows we're used to. Um, and the Australians always thought it, it was a comedy, but it isn't really. It's a parenting show that's funny and it's done differently. That show within three weeks was the most popular show on New Zealand television, on any channel. And that was all word of mouth because they, there was no promos for that show once it started. And, but we knew at the start that we were onto something because I would tell people at football matches or something what I was doing and people would say, oh, thank God somebody's gonna say that stuff, you know. And, so we kind of knew that there was a kind of a, a, a listening out there for it. And Nigel turned out to be a fantastic host and presenter. He's, he's just completely down to earth. What you see on screen is how he is. And he, if he has to, you know, if you're working in a crew and coffee has to be got or a tripod has to be carried, Nigel is the first person to do it. And he is, there's no huge ego there. And so it's really easy to work with them, you know, and you can say, look, we, no, that's wrong, Nigel. Oh, okay, so what should we do? It's no, it's very easy to work with them. The Science of Us is uh, a four part, four one hours about the Dunedin Longitudinal Study, which most people haven't heard of. But in 1973, uh, the Dunedin Medical School decided to follow every kid born in Dunedin from the day they were born for life. And so they've been following f 1,037 people for 40 years, and now they are now the thousand most studied people in the world, um, and that is probably the richest repository about human development and what makes us all who we are anywhere. And so the, the British government puts millions into that, the US government's put millions in. And again, what they've found out and what they know is incredible. You know, they've, you can spot criminals in kindergarten, which probably doesn't surprise a lot of kindergarten teachers. Um, gene for violence which is activated by events in your early life. Um, there's things they can measure at six which will predict your income at 30 something. All kinds of stuff like that. And so again it's just a rare opportunity to make a show that has a huge amount of content and I think interest. Almost everybody wants to know why they're like they are. They want to know why their kids are going to be like they are and that kind of stuff. So yeah look it's again it's a it's a rare treat to be able to make um, a show like that. I don't have many thoughts about my career to date. I've just done what I wanted to do in a way. I, um, I still have lots and lots of plans. I still have more ideas than I can um, get out and done and I'm limited by my time and I, I still like the idea of um, making for a larger audience, you know, I really like that. A while ago I decided I would only, if I could, 
um, work with people I liked and in projects I liked. Um, and so I try to do that, though I'm not crazy enough to turn down work if I needed to pay the mortgage.